building is a listed building, you're not only standing where the seating was, it currently still is. So you're literally standing on the seat of a theatre, which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And if you come forward a fraction more, and if you tilt your head, just up there is where the original projection room was as well. People often think that Burberry is a brand kind of born in the 90s, not 1856. And as you said, with the trench coat, we don't just make them here at Burberry, we actually invented a trench coat for World War One in the trenches. So as much as this is like a, an incredible piece of iconic fashion, it is incredibly functional as well. For example, this piece of the trench coat here, we call this the gun flap. So when you are in combat, for example, and you have a large gun, um, you get a lot of recoil on your chest. So the idea was that you put quite a big piece of fabric or foam underneath, that way you wouldn't have like a repeat injury, for example. The details you see here on the shoulder, for example, would typically denote rank of what kind of sergeant, what kind of level you are. But also on a more practical level, if you are going to be walking for miles upon miles in the trenches, you would simply unbutton the part just there, and then you'd put your bag on, then rebutton it. That way it stays in your back constantly. Um, other small details, again, unique to us at Burberry, would be the D-ring detail as well. Now, many people will tell you this is whole grenades. We all can see why this isn't very practical for grenades. <laughs> However, um, it was great for holding water bottles and other kind of military pieces as well. But my favorite part of the trench coat, besides the check lining, is the storm flap on the back. A lot of clients always say, what is this? Like, why is it flapping? Is it faulty? No. Um, with the flap just here, with Gabardine, which again is what we're kind of known for, is something very special to us. I think in 2020, we really kind of take for granted fabrics which are really breathable, really light, and can shield you from the rain. But going way back to the 18th century, this was all brand new. And Thomas Burberry, at the age of 21, um, really innovated with that. So at that time, if you wanted a jacket, it would be very large, very heavy, and typically made of rubber, so you'd sweat a lot. Whereas a gabardine, the kind of cotton, is very breathable, but still water repellent. With the storm flap, despite the jacket never really is going to get you wet anyway, when the rain comes down, it rolls straight off, so it never really sits anywhere. Now, when we look at Burberry today... So this particular trench, which is part of our pre-spring summer 20 collection, um, have any of you been to our Bond Street store before? We're going to change that this week. We're going to change it this week. Um, so essentially, when we um, renovated and reopened Bond Street, there was this big kind of wall. It was a blank wall. And I think it was, where is that? Ricardo, Ricardo Tishi, um, was the first person to sign his name. And then since then, clients, our team members, everyone has written all over that. So then now, we then use that entire wall for a collection of products. So our clients, our team members, all get to be a part of the Burberry going forward. So really it's like a big kind of brand moment in terms of history, mm. but it's all in the trench coat as well. Mm -hmm. Thomas Burberry being, you know, the thinker that he is. When Ricardo came on board, we went through the archives. He absolutely loves the archives. I can't stress that to you enough. Um, and on the Thomas Burberry family silver, there was a unicorn. So we're kind of running this idea of like, you know, Thomas Burberry being Unicorn, you know, we've never actually met him, but there's so many stories about him, innovation and imagination. Then Ricardo himself seems to have a slightly more practical, very logical, very robust. So Ricardo sees himself as the gorilla. So it's kind of bringing those two ideals together in the sense that this is the kind of Ricardo in a sense, but also with the imagination of Thomas Burberry as well. If we're looking more back to our actual history though, with our wonderful casual scarves, please feel free to have them feel. Does anyone know anything about our cashmere stars at all? <coughs> no? <Okay>. Now, <laughs> one of the things you may not know about our cashmere scarves that I love the most is the social good these scarves actually do. So this scarf in particular is 100% cashmere and it retails at £370. So I think when it comes to the social good, it's something we definitely should be kind of spending more time talking about. So when you look at the best place for cashmere, at Burberry we always like to make and source things from the best possible place. No compromise, ever. For example, I think it's Portugal has a very strong industry for shoes, espadrilles, for example. So go there for that. Leather goods, handbags out of Italy, the cashmere. We've identified Mongolia and Afghanistan as two best places for us to find our cashmere. So historically, a lot of these countries, when it comes to using animals, like goats, for example, usually it'd be for leather. 
But what Burberry's done, we've really partnered with the farmers out there and show them how not only how sustainable a cashmere industry is, but also profitable for them as well. So what we do as a company with the tools we have is we give them the best possible price for their cashmere. We partner with them, we work with them. Animals are getting treated better after all. When we get the cashmere, it's a very natural part of it. At some point in the year, these goats quite literally get far too hot. It's combed, it's brushed, it's cut. Very simple, no pain. I even go as far as saying it's vegan because the poor animal is actually enjoying itself. <laughs> um, in turn, Burberry then continues to work with these farmers so they get the best possible price for their cashmere locally as well. So we're paying them the best price to use cashmere in our scarves, but we're also stimulating their economy as well. So when you purchase from these scarves, you don't only get in something that's brilliant, you know, beautiful. The cashmere comes straight from there to Scotland, it's handmade, washed with water straight from, I think, the River Mossy, I believe, the River Elgin. And then it's brushed with lovely teasel, you know, all the craftsmanship is there after all. Scotland has years upon years of making cashmere just goods. Um, but you're also doing a lot of good for places a lot further afield than us as well. So that's pretty much everything, boys and girls.